Welcome to Diffuse Congruence Live. My name is Zaki Hassan. I am here with Pervez Ahmed. This is the American Muslim Experience coming to you from University of Michigan. That's right. We're at the business school, and it's great to be here. And uh, we took the red eye over, red but, eye. Uh, but we were able to get some rest today. And uh, I showed you some of my old haunts because I lived here for three yes. years, as I've shared with you many times. Um, so it's kind of good. It's really good to be back. It, it is. We, we got some rest, but we also had lots of coffee. So I'm, I'm running on like five cups of coffee right now. So I'm all, I'm all jittery and twitchy, so that's, that's why. Yeah. Uh, but we are very excited to be joined by our special guest for this episode. Uh, Dr. Suad Abdul-Kabir is a scholar, artist, and activist who uses anthropology and performance to explore the intersections of race and popular culture. She's currently an associate professor of American culture and Arab and Muslim American Studies here at the University of Michigan. She received her PhD in Cultural Anthropology from Princeton University and is a graduate from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. Her book, Muslim Cool, Race, Religion, and Hip-Hop in the United States, is an ethnography on Islam and hip-hop that examines how intersecting ideas of Muslimness and blackness challenge and reproduce the meanings of race in the United States. Dr. Abdul Kabir, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I, don't, I feel like I don't sound as exciting as you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm going to try to. I'm from a we're, we're extremely excited to have you. So yeah. thank you. I'll put my performer voice on so that I can match your your your, your sort of cadence and gravitas. Oh wow, cadence and gravitas. I like thank you. Yeah, I know. That's. I'm going to yeah, put that on a business card. <laughs> we don't get to compliment us enough. So thank you for that. Uh, and no, and and. Uh, in all sincerity, it really is an honor to have you and an honor to have you in front of this beautiful live audience. Um, and so with that, with that kind of an introduction, I know you're relatively new yourself to the University of Michigan and to the Michigan community. So, um, I, you know, we're sort of honored as well to be able to kind of have this as, serve as a occasion among many to kind of introduce you to the broader community. So, um, again, uh, many, many, um, it, it's, it's really honored to have you here. Um, I guess you, you know, maybe, maybe kind of begin as we often do, as, as Zucky sort of uh, uh, sort of joked about at, uh, at, during the outset, is what is sort of your origin story, and you know where do you hail from, and and in your kind of background, and what brought you to the University of Michigan? I know that's a lot, but right. we can kind of unpack that as as we like to say on the show, uh, slowly but surely. So, so what's the problem? It needs to be more central, I guess. Okay, let's see. Is that better? Yes. That is better. Yes. Okay. I, yeah. So, <laughs> right. Very yeah. good. Um, yeah, so I'm from Brooklyn, New York City, where they paint murals of Biggie. Um, that's the South <laughs> Poly verse. But before I get into my origin story, I want to begin, like I begin my book, in the name of Allah, for the love of Muhammad, to honor the ancestors and celebration of my people. I also want to begin by acknowledging that the land upon which we are gathered is the unceded and occupied territory of indigenous peoples of this region, um, and that some of us are uninvited guests, and we don't have to be. Um, I also want to acknowledge the histories of colonialism and imperialism that brought us here today, and that every day is Ashura and every land is Karbala. Huh. Um, and I actually was thinking about this because I listened to some of the podcasts before, and people were like origin stories, and I thought to myself, you know, I want to read a poem um, as a part of telling my origin story. Beautiful. Um, it's a poem that actually, is this published? It might be. Um, there is a, a, an anthology called Living Islam Out Loud, American Muslim Women Speak, that I did like a suite of poems for. So this may be there. It may not be. I don't remember. <laughs> In any event, the poem is called OS, which is an, short for original Sunni. Brooklyn style. The scent of Egyptian musk makes me reminiscent of when we were kids and the masjid was the after Juma place to chill, where we played on its city street corner, only interrupted by the Avan and trips to the store for steak and take and five cent candy. 
where at 10, we played double dutch by the sister's entrance, but by 13, traded in double dutch for obviously disinterested strolls past the brother's side. Huh. When Eid was in Prospect Park, and you probably missed the first prayer because Umi had been frying chicken to fudge her, but you looked good when you got there in your new outfit and shoes. When you said Umi and Abby instead of Mommy and Daddy, Shukran instead of Thank You, use Misrak along with, not instead of, a toothbrush. <laughs> when McDonald's was halal, when hijab meant rocking a right bread kimar with your new red kicks, when polygamy was more common, less frequent, when your grandparents were, were non-Muslim and you loved them just the same, before Jabab became fard, music haram, and long pants sinful, mm -hmm. before Salafi, Sunni, Shi'i, Sufi, Wahhabi became off-thrown terms, before presidential endorsements and nightline specials, sure. before being Muslim was the greatest crime of our time, was a time and a space in this world of a community who, despite all of our contradictions and life's hard knocks, we knew who we were. We were Muslim, proud, and happy. And outside the masjid at 786 Third Ave, Brooklyn, New York, Dar es Salaam, the children sang. And now you have to repeat after me. Everywhere we go. Everywhere we go. People want to know. People want to know. Who we are. Who we are. Where we come from. Where, where we, we come, come from. from. What do we tell them? What, what do, do we, we tell them? them? We are the Muslims, the mighty, mighty Muslims. We are the Muslims, the mighty, mighty Muslims. And so this poem is one that I wrote um, sort of reflecting on where I come from and, yeah. how, and how I was raised. And you kind of, I, I think the poem is meant to paint this picture. It's vivid, right? yeah. Right? No, no, it's a very vivid picture. Um, of, of, of a community, right? And so, like I said, I'm from Brooklyn. Um, everything starts in Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> every, everything good starts in Brooklyn. <laughs> um, right. Um, and, uh, you know, I was thinking, you know, even like my parents who divorced when I was probably three months old, but they got married in Brooklyn. Okay. Hmm. Um, and so Brooklyn is sort of really important to who I am and how I walk through the world and, you know, how I understand stuff. And so I was born, although, and I don't tell people this, although it's in some Brooklyn Historical Museum thing now, so it's public information, but I literally was actually born in Syracuse, which hmm. is something I like, shh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I was born in Syracuse, New York, because my father was in law school at the time. So my parents... Um, are they converted to Islam, but separately? Okay. Um, my father is an immigrant from Panama, which is a country in Central America. He came to the United States when he was around 13 years old, and he became Muslim in the late 70s in Brooklyn because that's where he grew up um, when he was in the states. Um, and he actually became Muslim through the Ansar Law, which was a early kind of Black Muslim community that is no longer, right. but it was at the time. Right. Um, and so he became Muslim the Ansarullah. And my mother, Alayah Hamha, she um, was born in Queens. Um, uh, actually, no, sorry. She was born in Harlem. Mm. And her parents were born in Harlem. But her grandparents were immigrants from Montserrat and Barbados from the Caribbean. Mm. Um, and she, but she grew up in Queens, Jamaica, Queens, because her father um, uh, was a fireman. So he was an early black fireman. Um, and so she grew up, um, she was like of her cousins, one of the few had her, like a, her own room in a house and that kind of stuff in Queens, which back then apparently was like the country, you mm. know, Queens, New York. Um, and then she went to Ohio State for college. And while there, um, she became a student activist, helped to start black studies at Ohio State, was a part of the Black Panther Party, African nationalist. And then when she came back to New York City, um, she was working, I think, as a paralegal, although my mother ended up working as a teacher in public school for like 30 years before she um, retired. And in 1975, um, she has this story that she told me where um, she was visiting a political prisoner um, in Greenhaven Correctional Facility, uh, which is in um, upstate New York. Mm. And Greenhaven Correctional Facility had and I think it still exists, they had what was called the San Cori Masjid, so it was a, a mosque in the prison that was named after the famous San Cori Mosque in Timbuktu. Mm -hmm. And um, there she was visiting, and they were having a molid um, at the prison. So she was visiting, and she said, you know, when she was in college, the Islamic party had come, and they were trying to, like, give dawah, but she said, I don't want no parts of that Islam because the Arabs enslaved the Africans, so I don't want no parts of that. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, but 
um, as she sort of learned more about Islam. And so basically she said she was at the Molid and um, whatever the imam said at the time, who actually she, she told me was um, one of Malcolm X's former bodyguards, I think, um, who was the imam giving the, the sermon. But whatever she said, it kind of struck her. And actually I have a clip of this. So I run this website, Sapelo Square. So I have a clip of the video um, of her talking about it on there. And she said, whatever, it moved her. And so she decided to take her shahada. So, and one of the things about Sankori that I found out after sort of doing research based on her interview is that they say that some the scholars say that between, so she became Muslim in March of 75. And they say between 74 and 76, probably that mosque, Sankori, in the prison had more conversions than any mosque in the country. Yeah. And a wow. lot of the conversions were not people who were incarcerated, people who were visiting, right? People who were visiting. So that's how so she became Muslim there. So they became Muslim separately. Right. Um, and then in 77, I just actually talked to my father about this. So in 77, they apparently met at an MSA convention in Indiana. Because um, you know, this was an MSA before there was this one. Right, and that must have been one of, well, not one of the earliest ones, because I think they started they doing like back in the 60s. 60s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But by yeah. 70, late 70s. Right, yeah, so yeah. they met at an MSA thing right. in Indiana, um, and then got married fairly quickly. Um, and um, I think, because I think it was spring, and then they got married by September. And my mother told me this funny story, because she said they got married three times. Um, so the first time um, was by... Um, was in Staten Island, because there's an Islamic school, Al Madras Islamia, which is one of the oldest um, Muslim schools in New York City that was in Staten Island. So I think there was a brother in Staten Island who married them. And then they did another wedding. Um, and so, and this is like, it's like a sort of historic in the sense of the person who officiated it. So my mother used to be a part of, and she used to attend the State Street Masjid in Brooklyn, which is one of the older or oldest right. meshes in Brooklyn. And it was founded by Sheikh Dawood Faisal and That's Mother right. Khadija. And Mother Khadija actually and my mother have the same birthday. Um, and so Sheikh Dawood Faisal, he signed their marriage certificate. Wow. And so like I have a copy of it and so his yeah. signature's That's... on there. And then they had what well, she said, she's like, my mother was not gonna believe I was married unless I had like a proper wedding, because huh. I have a proper wedding. So they had a, um, a reception. Um, at the Pratt Community Towers in Brooklyn um, in November of 77. And I was born in June of 78. Okay, 1978. Um, you, you've, you've touched on so much, and, and Zucky often likes to give that analogy of the uh, tapestry. And a couple of things that you've mentioned do come up, or have come up time and time again, you know, for those who've listened to the show. One is the, straight, the uh, State Street Mosque. Mm -hmm. That's been mentioned a number of times. Um, maybe, again, just to recap or, or to... Uh, bring our listeners up to speed with regards to the significance of the state of the State Street Mosque and Imam Daoud Faisal. If you could maybe just yeah. in a nutshell, yeah. So I think, I think that's really yeah, important. Yeah, I, mean, I think State Street, like I said, like I I, I don't know, um, like you know, we try to be always the first first. I don't know if it's the first first. I won't make that claim because right. I don't know. And I haven't done the research, but I do know it's among the, one of the earliest um, masjids that was established in New York City and in the country more broadly. Um, and it was founded by Imam um, Sheikh Dawood Faisal, who was an immigrant from the Caribbean, and his wife, Mother Khadija. And um, that community, you know, uh, one of the elders from that community actually just passed away, I want to say a week and a half ago, Mama Raki Abdurrahman. Wow. And she was a secretary for State Street Masjid. Wow. Um, and she became Muslim, I want to say, by the 40s, she was Muslim. I mean, she, and she died. She was and she and I actually have the same birthday. And so we're like 80 years apart. So um, she just passed away like in her late 80s. Mm. And so that masjid in, was one of these places where, you know, Brooklyn, New York, and Brooklyn, that area of Brooklyn, also had a very, had a large Arab population on Atlantic Avenue as well. And there's still some remnants of that today. Um, but this community, I think, was at least established by um, sort of these Caribbean, black Caribbean immigrants, converts to Islam. And then they brought people to teach. And so there was a Dr. Dunya who was from... Egypt, who would teach Islamic classes there as well as Sheikh Faisal. So it was this community. And I think what's important for me about State Street is that, like, Mama Rakia would, would be like, she's like, she's like a grandmother to me. Her children were raised Muslim, right? So they were raised Muslim. So her grandkids are like third, fourth generation Muslim. So this kind of early black, early Muslim community, early black Muslim community 
Um, and also they were sort of coming out of the, what people call today the Sunni tradition. So mm -hmm. they were not a part of the Nation of Islam. Right. They were not a part of the um, Ahmadiyya. They were not a part of the more science temple. Um, so they were kind of coming out of sort of a Sunni, whatever, whatever that term means to people, sure, sure. Um, tradition sort of early on. Um, and a lot of, in New York City, and, and sort of, and part of my work now um, is around, um, I have a, I started this website I call Umi's Archive. And part of the work that I'm doing with Umi's Archive is really trying to um, preserve and curate and share and sort of understand and analyze um, the kinds of people that raise me, mm -hmm. right? And so one of the things for me um, is that and this is what the poem is attempting to um, illustrate, is that I grew up in a community um, that was very affirming um, of who I was as a black person, as a person of the diaspora, as a Muslim, as a woman, like all of those, there was, there was no problems with any of that. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean we, there weren't issues, because obviously there were always issues. Yeah. But, the people who raised me, specifically the women who raised me, mm -hmm. right, raised me to recognize that I am an heir to an important tradition and legacy, and I have a responsibility to sort of continue and to push that forward, and that I have the potential and the possibility to do whatever I want to do, mm -hmm. right? And, that, and while acknowledging that we are very much um, victims of sort of white supremacy, capitalism and imperialism and patriarchy and all those things, right? And those are very real systems and structures that that are designed to sort of keep us back. Huh. But we have but but that's but that's their design, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> so and so and not God's design. That's right. So wow. you know, so you know it's there and you can identify it and you see it, but but it doesn't define you. You define mm -hmm. yourself. And so this is kind of where I come from. Like right. this is what this was and that's what it meant to kind of grow up in Brooklyn. Um, and, and again, you know, just, just mm -hmm. previous themes or uh, things that we've touched on um, that I'm curious about is the Sankori Masjid, for one. Is that affiliated with the Sankori Institute, like that comes no, about later no. on? So this is, just, no, this is a separate. Okay. But you do know what I'm talking yeah, about. Like the second, yeah, and, yeah and but that's much later. And I, I, think, and I would imagine same. probably there is a probably intellectual genealogy no, that connects right. them or West a spiritual Africa. one. Mm -hmm. um, but in the sort of, in terms of the actual establishment, in fact, the Sankori Masjid was established by the Dar es Salaam movement. Oh, okay. And so that's who established that Masjid. In the Another. Another yeah, sort of early wrinkle that we've touched on certainly. Uh, you know, Dr. Bagby was on, who mm -hmm. kind of talked about his experiences within that community. Um, and then finally, you know, we you can't. I mean, at least for a lot of us, like or someone like myself, as a child of the '80s and '90s, certainly coming of age in Islam in the '90s or uh, Islam in America in the '90s, when you hear Brooklyn and you hear you know, Masjid, you think Masjid Taqwa mm -hmm. and Imam Sirad. So I'm wondering. I'm just curious if that's yeah, the community yeah. so, um, that you happen to. Right, so my mother, my mother um, was a very um, past guest of the show too. I, I right, like to yeah. throw that in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my, I mean, I know him, Siraj, and his kids, and everybody. Mm. Yeah, you know, my mother was very um, ecumenical in her practice of Islam, mm -hmm. um, and like so that. we went everywhere. Um, there was an early point um, in uh, my life where we did attend um, at Chautauqua, um specifically. I, I remember being a little kid and running around there. And um, at that time, um, I also, because my mother was with a lot of communities, mm -hmm. I also would um, go to Masjid Musi Khalifa, which is like three blocks down from Taqwa, which was originally um, Temple Number 7C that was part of Nation of Islam that became Masjid Khalifa when the transition from Nation of Islam mm -hmm. um, happened. And this, that place, 7C, um, was found, Malcolm X, he found that, um, that place. It used to be called the Sonia Ballroom. Um, and so as a young child, because I went to Islamic school, and we, we also had, like, Girl Scouts and stuff. And so I remember our Girl Scout troops, we would have stuff at Khalifa and at Taqwa, like, all over these different kind of places or mm -hmm. whatever. But I want to say probably when I was 12 or 13, I was a summer camp counselor at a camp at Khalifa. And then I started joining the, the youth kind of programming stuff there. And I also did a lot of, like, um, my, like again, my mother, we went everywhere, so I also did a lot of mostly from North America stuff, so I used to go to those camps, and yeah. I did stuff like that. And so Khalifa is, like, my home. Yeah. Um, and so that is, so that's kind of, like, that's where I, when I was, like, an adolescent coming into teenager, you know, moving into adulthood, sort of my sort of meshed home was Khalifa. 
you, you walk down the block to Taqwa because Shabin still has a place where he steak and takes. And, and now there's the big, Abu's Bakery is there. And I have friends there. And that's all it's cool. You know, no harm, no foul. Thanks. Um, what, I, I was wondering if we could uh, dive into your book in, in terms of uh, Muslim Cool. The, I mean, this is an ethnographic study of the intermingling between uh, uh, hip-hop and Islam. And, and I, I was reading an interview with you where you talked about how being Muslim is perceived in the broader monoculture versus how it's perceived in hip-hop culture. And I found that distinction you drew really fascinating. I was wondering if you could elaborate yeah, on that. Yeah, no, definitely. So the book, Muslim Cool, right, is, like you said, it's this um, study of looking. So what, what I'm really interested in doing in Muslim Cool is thinking about the relationship between kind of Muslim identity and black identity and Muslim identity and blackness um, in the United States and what that will teach us about what, what race and blackness mean in the United States. And so Islam and hip-hop become the space in which I kind of explore that. And I think that today, and particularly in this particular, in this sort of contemporary moment, people think of Muslims and they think of Islam. And I think this is we all know this, right? As kind of foreign and sort of both foreign in the sense of coming from elsewhere, but also foreign in the sense of kind of practices so traditional and backward. And you don't like music, huh. you don't have fun, and you don't laugh, you don't smile. All these kinds of really mm. kind of you know sort of mythical notions of who Muslims are conjured are. up, yeah. right? Um, whereas in hip hop um, music and culture, you know, when you look at sort of the early, um, the early, the sort of development of hip hop music and culture, um, and you look at the sort of people and ideas that are influencing people who are creating that, creating that music and culture, you know, Muslims and particularly Black Muslims and what I call Black Islam is central to that. And the argument that I make in the book is that when we talk about hip hop, people talk about it in terms of elements. And so you have kind of the artistic elements. And so there's DJing, emceeing, dance, and graffiti. Mm -hmm. And then there's knowledge, knowledge of self, huh. which is the fifth element of hip hop. And this fifth element is kind of coined, or the fifth element, um, this, the phrase itself, knowledge of self, um, was taken directly from the Nation of Islam. Yeah. And in his book, Message to the Black Man, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has a chapter where he talks about knowledge of self. And knowledge of self, in his iteration, and then also <laughs> what connects it to hip hop's iteration of knowledge of self, is this idea that you have to know where you come from, particularly the histories that have been hidden because the dominant don't tell those stories, in order to understand where you're presently located, yeah. so that you can therefore change the future. And knowledge of self is a kind of way of being in the world about your relationship to other people, the natural world, um, the divine. This is in knowledge of self. So if you don't have knowledge of self, you can't do anything. <laughs> One of the things I always, I've begun to tell people is like, you know, we think about what we're dealing with in the United States and globally right now, white supremacy is like, we need white folks to get knowledge of self. Like, seriously. <laughs> like, if they had knowledge of self, like, we wouldn't have all these problems. <laughs> so, no, point. It's really, it's like, because you don't know who you are, you don't really understand, and then you, you know, you sort of work against your own interests, all this kind of stuff, right? Because you don't really know who you are. And knowledge of self, um, being an element of hip hop, right, is something that therefore means that, and it being something that's taken from Black Muslim sort of tradition, therefore makes hip hop central, right? I mean, it makes Islam and Black Islam central to what hip hop music culture is, and also makes Black Islam see, be seen as something that is about consciousness raising, right? So, whereas the dominant culture will sort of portray Islam and Muslims as something that is a danger to you and that is something that actually is a danger to your consciousness and to your sort of expression and to your sort of growth and your development intellectually and culturally and spiritually hmm. in hip hop communities and then in broader black communities, particularly in urban black communities in like kind of the you know, major cities, mm -hmm. Islam is, is the opposite of that, right? If you want to be righteous, if you want to be conscious, if you want to be active, if you want to have this kind of social justice way of being in the world, like one of the ways you can do that, people presume, is if you're Muslim, right? And so that is sort of this difference. And and I think, and so, and one of the other things I'll add to that. That has a history, which I think I, I really want to get into, because I think for a lot of people, especially those who of us who grew up either in suburban enclaves or come from the... Um, uh, you know, uh, South Asian or Arab experience, 
uh, we don't appreciate uh, the way in which is, uh, Islam becomes a vehicle of social protest and um, you know um, a, a voice against the mainstream uh, against the dominant culture mm -hmm. the way it does in the uh, in, in the Black American mm -hmm. Muslim or, or Black Islam, as mm -hmm. you said, which that that term itself I think also deserves some unpacking, mm -hmm. if you will, because that is not. A monolith in and of itself. It's a, it's a composite of various movements, histories, cultural experiences that you've sort of fused together within that, in, including Sunni and Shia Islam as well, quote unquote, orthodoxy as well as heterodox voices. So maybe what people call heterodox. Oh yeah, what people would. I wouldn't call them. Heterodox. Sure. sure. <laughs> Fair enough. Yes. Fair enough. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so those come together within Black Islam, and then you've got also this really interesting confluence of things that are happening. Uh, especially in your northern urban centers like Detroit, uh, Brooklyn, New York, Chicago, where you've got uh, the great migration of black uh, migration coming from southern, um, from, from, from southern region, yeah, from the south states, going up and then meeting and coming together in these urban centers. And there you have, you've got the fusion of that whole, of, of where hip hop really its origin story begins, as it were. Yeah, yeah. And it's infused directly with these great Muslim well, yeah, I mean, I mean I, of course, when yeah. we think about the kind of resurgence or re, um, re-emergence of Islam amongst black communities in the United States, you know, migration plays a, a huge part. So both the kind of, like sure. you're saying, the, the great migration, so the migration of black folks from southern, southern parts of the U.S. and then sort of migration of people who are Muslim from sort okay. of the Middle East and South Asians early. So, I mean, that, that's how we think of Islam, right? Right. Because, because, because you have these interactions between these people um, who are all migrants. Right. From different places um, and sort of meeting in these urban centers. Um, and, and as well as then, and then, and so black folks from the South and also folks from the Caribbean as well who are coming as sure. well. So kind of this, these, this center of these, these city or industrial urban centers become points of contact. Right. They become kind of this, yeah, where, 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 where this um, interaction is taking place. Now, one of the things that I've heard, for example, like Dr. Jackson argues, is that that migration away from the South, which was which what where 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 the voice of the black church was so predominant, mm -hmm. and, and that movement to the north, i.e., you know, moving away, if you will, from the influence of the black church, does that lend itself to, uh, you know, this new, if you will, migrating community um, uh, to sort of find and and dabble it w in and with Islam and. Does that kind of I mean, begin I mean, as... I think, you know, I was actually just recently reading Sylvia Chan Malik's new book, Being Muslim, yeah, and fast. she opens up with this chapter on um, this <coughs> photo, which she thinks probably the... She says, she, I think she I think this is probably like one of the oldest photos of black Muslim women, kind of like some post-antebellum, sort of a black Muslim women, who were part of the Ahmadi movement in Chicago, right? right? And true. And so... Forget and about she, the and she And she makes this point about um, the... Because I, I I don't think it's about the the lack of influence of the black church because black churches are strong and they were strong in the north too. Okay. But I do think that um, migration and being in new places, right? And I think this is one of the arguments that Chan Malik makes, like create opportunities opportunities to meet and experience and see new things, right? And sort of sure. connect with new things. And so. And so, and so, therefore, Islam kind of falling into that. Right? Mm -hmm. she, in her in her book, when she talks about like basically the Ahmadis used to have a um, a they were the Chicago Defender, major black newspaper, and they would have an ad in the women's section inviting people to their to their meetings. Mm -hmm. And so these women, but she, she you know she's recreating this history. She's like, well, they probably read this thing and decided to go. And we know, for example, you know, there would be no nation of Islam. It's just the Clara Muhammad did not go and hear Master Fard first. She heard him. And then she told Elijah because he was sort of unemployed and he had she was drinking and she was trying to get her, you know, she got these kids and her husband, he is ain't right. Mm -hmm. This sounds like something good, right? So she tells him, let's go hear this man, right? Um, and so of course and again, and so let's talk about the importance and significance of women, mm -hmm. right? And the roles that women play. Um, you know, and, and I like to think about this sometimes in terms of, you know, like who was the first person who told Muhammad that he was, no, you're not crazy. Khadija. You know, right? That's right. And so the role of, of women in sort of establishing sort of Muslim movements sort of since then mm -hmm. until today. And so I think that 
Yes, yeah, so I think that migration and movement definitely sort of created opportunities for new things. And I think, and you see lots of different kinds of, in black religion, you see lots of different kinds of spiritual movements, not just Muslim oriented, sure. that also emerged, right, in the cities at this time mm. um, as well. Okay, okay. And then, so wh wh where does then, uh, and so hip hop as a development is occurring while all these interactions are happening. Well, no, this is, well, hip-hop's later. Okay. Because so we're talking about 1920s, 1920s. Got it, got right? it. Okay, so. So, but by the time hip-hop emerges, so hip-hop emerges in the late 60s, right? Out of the sort of black um, art. Right, and so hip-hop is emerging, is coming into being um, sort of at the heels of the civil rights sort of era, uh -huh. um, and at the heels of the black power era, mm -hmm. and particularly, and when I say the heels, in terms of the ways in which those movements were really repressed by um, state violence and incarceration, right? So these moves, but the but the emphasis, and particularly for Black Power, and one of the things I know in hip hop too, and this is why Nation of Islam becomes so important to hip hop as well, is because of the impact of Malcolm X and the okay. impact of the nation in terms of its emphasis on self pride and community. So you know, so pride in yourself, love for yourself. Um, and sort of commitment to sort of building your community, right? Okay. Um, in his book, uh, Jeff Chang's book, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, he um, quotes one of the um, one of the people people call the godfathers of hip-hop saying, you know, I would hear them, like the Nation of Islam, and they would like stand up black man, like get up black man, right? Mm -hmm. And that inspired me to think differently about how I was living my life. Okay. Now the thing about hip-hop, which is important in migration again, is that, so Islam at this point is not, is black. Right. It's not like it's it's not sort of, um, a, you know, it's, how do I want to say this? So Islam is black. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. And hip hop is being developed by people who are black. Mm -hmm. Right. And people who are from the diaspora, That's which right. means people who are also from the Spanish speaking Caribbean mm -hmm. and people who are. So people who are Latinx, people who are West Indian. So like cool her, like people it's Jamaican, right? People West right. Indian, people from the South who live in New York City. So it's, it's black and the, and, the, and the only amount of brown brownness is coming from the, the, the kind of Latin, like well, I mean, Latino. Yeah, so, I mean, so, so, so hip hop is, and you're, right, so hip hop, yeah. so, so, but the point, when I say, but when I say Islam is black, I guess what I'm trying to say mm -hmm. is that Islam is black, right, but blackness is global. That's right. Right? So Islam is black, blackness is diaspora, blackness is transnational. So Islam is black, right, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean it's American in that sense, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. because the kinds of ways in which black Muslims engage black identity at that period, which was about identifying that your experience as a black person is not defined or confined to your history in the United States, right? Because that is the way in which I understand it. And, and that kind of consciousness raising, I think is also part of what then shapes hip hop. Mm. So you kind of pick up on that, right? Um, and, and that kind of comes into sort of their own notion of what it means to create this music and culture as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and one of the things you find then, and I talk about this in the book, for example, when I interviewed Pop Master Fable, yeah. who was sort of a legendary hip hop artist, part of the Rocksteady crew, and he talks about, now he's Muslim, but he wasn't always Muslim. And before he became Muslim, he talks about listening to these early radio shows where people would say stuff like, Asalaamu Alaikum, oh, right? Nice. And then he would talk, and he talked about, um, sort of people would do these break beats where they would have speeches from Malcolm X or Farrakhan and like, so, and, and for him, he was like, and it's all about this consciousness raising. Like that's what, that's what Islam and Muslims meant. People who were talking about consciousness and, and doing the right thing and this kind of thing, that's who, that's where that came from. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of like a uh, tribe called Quest and then they sample like Imam Siraj, going right, back to what right. we, you, we were talking about <laughs> earlier. So I see sort of history yeah, yeah. kind of playing out. Very, very interesting. Um, the uh, and, and again, you, you've, you've brought up a lot of things, and I, I, I was flipping here because I wanted to look for a quote where you talk about this idea of blackness. Uh, and, you know, blackness in Muslim cool is rooted in diaspora, of the shared black experience in America, black culture and politics in conversation with blacks in other parts of the Americas, and right. that's kind of yeah. what you were touching on, and that's a direct quote from the book. Um, one of the things that I, I think it would be important for the audience is to understand is when you use the term Muslim cool, uh, because you've called it, it, you know, it resists and reconstitutes U.S. Uh, or United or racial hierarchy in the United States. Um, how so, and, and what do you mean when you employ the term Muslim cool? Right. So Muslim cool is yeah. a term that I kind of use to describe um, a way of being Muslim and thinking about what it means to be Muslim 
that engages blackness. Okay. Um, and does so to counter anti-blackness. Um, and counter anti-blackness as it appears in the broader society, but also as it appears in Muslim communities, hmm. right? Um, and, um, and I think that, so I'm distracted because it's mother. Yeah. We, we were going to uh, try to wrap by like eight uh, or I think a little after eight and then try to pray at that okay. point. Okay, yeah. all right. That's yeah, fine. rather than break in the middle. Okay, all right, fine. Um, I know people are probably going to be getting antsy as well. Right, right, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, so yeah, so Muslim cool is um, so this way of doing that. And so this idea of reproducing and, and, and kind of resisting and reproducing. So, and I use this when thinking about hip hop. So with hip hop, um, you know, one of the things about black culture and black culture in the United States is that people, it can be engaged to challenge anti-blackness as well as reproduce it. So mm. one of the things I, so an example like from the book that I will use is, um, yes. So one of the things I talk about in the book, um, one of the chapters is the idea of blackness and the ways in which South Asian and Arab youth American communities engage blackness and particularly black men and black. So it's kind of this idea of black men who are preachers and so this idea that, and the ways in which blackness can be devalued or instrumentalized. So huh. let's break that down. That's a lot. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. So, one by one. Right. So, <laughs> so it, devaluation. So okay. devaluation basically, right, that means that something you don't think it has value, right? Okay. So in the book, in this chapter, the same chapter, I talk about um, an Isna convention that I went to where um, this uh, artist, DJ Manawax, who's South Asian, I'm um, used American background, he has a crew, and they come and they're invited to Isna to perform for like a youth night. Okay. And they have this song called 99 Names, and you know, they have some people who are doing some, um, some dance, like some, you know, like some, some breaking, some b-boying or whatever. Um, and, they're, and they got the song, and, and Manawax, he is you know, on the turntable, on the ones and twos, and, and he has created this um, kind of mix, right, where he's sort of mixing in, like, Ganawa, Kalali, and hip-hop, and he's, like, mixing it. And so there are these guys on the side who are, like, you know, like an an anxious, because they're like, you can't do that, you can't scratch a lot of name, you can't, you know, all this kind of stuff, right? And it's like... And Manuel is like, well, first of all, I don't scratch a last name. But second of all, he's like, because he thought about that. But also, he's like, what I'm doing with the turntable is, is no different than what people do with their voices when they sing the sheet or something like that. You mm -hmm. extend, you contract, mm -hmm. you know, like this is the same thing. Like, so mm -hmm. this is the big deal. And so I had a conversation with him. I was like, well, I was like, well, a couple of things are happening here. I was like, one, people are ambivalent about music; they don't really know, and, and right. so, so that's kind of haram. And then I was like, and then they don't understand that the, the, the human body is also a technology, like the turntable is, and that's haram. And then it's hip hop, and it's black, so it's really haram. It's like haram, <laughs> and haram, and haram. And people they, they trip the trifecta. Right, of haram. right, right. They're like they don't know; they, they can't okay. handle it. Right. And so part of and so this idea of devaluation is that even though the music, and I have another example too of this, um, even though the music itself and what it's talking about, what it's doing is really just like the other kind of music you think is acceptable, because the music comes out of a black community and black, and black expression, mm. and because you, because of anti-blackness, it's religiously suspect, it's questionable, you're not really sure, you don't want to deal with it, right? And so you devalue it. That's the devaluation. So, it, just one second. Okay. So like with devaluate, like devaluation, is that kind of like within the Muslim community today, um, almost kind of like the modern minstrel, right? Where the like where the where the the concept of a black person is either limited to the preacher or the artist. Well, that's instrumental. Okay, instrumental. So devaluing okay. basically is the yeah. idea that we don't let we right Muslims are uncomfortable with, or we don't want to let black expressive culture into our space. Okay. Right, because so we're because it's like this is not Islam. Mm -hmm. hmm. Now, instrumentalization is the opposite. When I say preachers and poets, so yeah. we're doing a fundraiser. My mashit is in some suburb somewhere. We're doing a fundraiser. We want the youth to come. So we're gonna invite Imam Siraj. We're gonna invite Mr. Mom. We're gonna invite. We're gonna invite them. To come. That is such a familiar story. It is. That's yeah. why I can relate. So we're and gonna it's... invite them to yeah. come. Right. And they're gonna give and because they're cool. Mm -hmm. And they're expressive, and you know, and preachers and poets, like they do. I mean, it's a performance, right? Sure. Right. So, sure. so there, and, and there's a rich tradition, a performance tradition in black and black culture. So, you know, they're going to do right. this thing. But the problem with that is that 
that's the only time you're going to see somebody black on a roster hmm. in that community. Like, ever. And when they leave, they go back to wherever they came from. Mm-hmm. And then your community, if there are black people in it, they, they feel marginalized, they feel put out. You mm-hmm. know, So you're just, and, and whatever you're fundraising for ain't really about black people neither. So, right, so it's like, so it's a tool, right? Mm-hmm. So then mm-hmm. I, I, I referenced this in, in the book in my conclusion, the actress, Amandla Stenberg, she has this thing she did for a class, um, like I guess she's in college called Don't, Don't Cash Crop My Cornrows. And she talks about like the ways in which, like cornrows in particular, she's yeah. talking about the ways in which black culture gets appropriated, right? And ways in which like and, and cultural appropriation is about this idea that you is about power difference, right? Okay. So I have more power than you. You create something. When you do it, it's bad. When you do it, it's hood. When you do it, it's low class. When you do it, whatever. Now I'm gonna do it, and it's cool, and it's chic, and this kind of thing. And then I created it. So like when I think it was Mark Jacobs. When he tried to say Bantu knots, he created them. He called them something. Or like when the Kardashians had cornrows and they were called like boxer braids, all of a sudden it was like, whoa. You know, this kind of thing, right? <laughs> but the thing that I quote, I talk about her video, but the thing that I quote, she's like, what happens if we love black people as much as we love black culture? Mm. And so that's also huh. a question, right, for Muslim communities in Got the it. United States, non-black ones in particular as well, but also some black folks because there's this internalized, you know, sort of self hate that happens too. Right. So, so that's instrumentation. Right. Okay. So, so the idea is that, so... So on one hand, so just to kind of go back to Muslim yeah. cool, so on one hand, you have folks like the, like Manowax, right? Folks that I was dealing with who may or may not be black, but they engage hip-hop music and culture. They engage blackness, and they're challenging anti-black because what is he doing? So he's like, I'm going to these spaces mm-hmm. where they don't want me to be, where they don't want to play this, and I'm going to play this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But on the flip side, you can have this kind of reproduction of it when it only, when, okay, well, we're going to, yeah, come bring the hip-hop. Bring your hip-hop, right? Um, but that, but only for this purpose, only for that time, and we're not going to actually make any structural changes in our communities around anti-blackness. We're just going to use it for what we need for right now, right? And so it can do both of those things. Mm. And that's not particular to Muslims or Muslim cool, but that's actually particular to the ways in which race operates in the United States mm. at this moment in time. Mm. The ways in which... Um, because the United States is post-civil rights, we have a national culture that is about multiculturalism, yeah. right? And everybody belongs. Mm-hmm. But everybody actually doesn't belong, right? And it's the ways in which like, black folks triumph over slavery and Jim Crow becomes a testament to American exceptionalism, as opposed to right, a testament to how far the country still has to go, right? Mm. See what I mean? So on one hand... Like I think in your introduction, you talk about... I pointed this out to you in the plane, remember? Um, yep. the, the black characters in the kingdom, I think? In the, the, siege, the siege. The siege and the kingdom, right. where they sort of are the leaders of the group or what have you, but it's, again, in, 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 further, uh, in furtherance of American exceptions. Well, right. Denzel in the siege is like, the, this is right. what America's about. And, we, yeah. and because we become these symbols of American progress, progress. while, right? In fact, yeah. while black folks yeah. are still catching hell. Right, and that doesn't change that, mm. but it just becomes a rhetoric and a pos- it, it becomes a way to talk about stuff, mm. right? Um, but it doesn't change what's happening on the ground, and mm. so and so Muslim cool right has the potential, right, to change what's happening on the ground, but it can also become something that just becomes this rhetoric, okay. you know, over oh, cool. We have lots of stuff. Muslims do this too, and you know that. Kind yeah, of thing. right, right. <laughs> Um, I think there was some things like in the in the article about like uh, the representation piece that Dr. Yeah, well, I mean, just uh, the, the the piece uh, for Vice uh, yeah. that you just, just earlier this week, where you were talking about uh, the sort of mini controversy that erupted a couple months ago when Representative uh, Talib uh, used used a naughty word, and and suddenly that became, you know, for a brief moment, that was the literally the most important thing happening in this country. And and what I thought was very uh, thought-provoking was your uh, critique of the critique she aroused from within the Muslim community, yeah. uh, where it, it was less based in faith, like, oh, it's un-Islamic to use naughty language, but more like, we don't want to lose, we just got, we got access now, we don't want to lose that. Well, I mean, I, so I think people 
claim it's based on faith. Sure. But I'm saying that's a false claim. It's disingenuous, right. you're saying. Right, yes. I'm saying that because, I mean, and then we don't want to talk about how people just talk to each other back in the day, right? That's I mean, like, please. The yeah. Kind of like, yeah. So, but even, even, but that being said, like, I don't really cuss, like, you know, I wasn't really, I get that. But no, but it wasn't about that. It wasn't. What it was about was that, you know, people are, like, when you are sort of invisible or marginalized, right? There's a, and, and when you are Muslim, so you we call this kind of thing kind of a hyper visibility, right? Huh. So it's like you are like who you are, like everything about you is like super visible, right? I really like really really see you, right? Of course I don't see you, right? Mm. But I see what I think you are, right? right. So, so you're hyper visible. So there's a lot of scrutiny. Yeah. Right? Okay. Right. Right. And so when there's a lot of scrutiny on you, you're concerned about. You know, okay, well, what do people think about me? Or what are people right. thinking, right? But there are a variety of ways to respond to that, right? But what, but one of the ways I think the critique was responding to that with her was basically being like, okay, well, then we need to make sure we're really good, we're really clean, you know, you don't say bad words, like, you know, when they go low, low we go mm-hmm. high, you know, this kind of thing, yeah. whatever, anyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. And it's like, you know, and it's kind of like, but that's a like a double edged sword, right? Because 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 you know suits won't save you. You know what I mean? Like good language is not going to mm. save you, right? I mean they they had dogs on people in the suits in the civil rights movement, right? I mean Martin Luther King was killed. He they assassinated him in the suit. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, mm. So like that like you know sort of respectability is not going to save you, right? Um, and and and. When and all and, and I've mentioned this at some place else. I was talking about this. I'm just thinking about someone like her, right? Mm-hmm. She's like, so she's a Palestinian American Muslim woman, you know, in Congress, the first of a first of a first, in a space that wasn't built for her to be in. Structures that will continue to try to find ways to marginalize her out, and the people who should have her back are like talking about because she said about the man who's doing what to everybody. Right, you know? yeah. And it's like, and so for me, it's like, you know, the, like, you know, you, you don't like people cursing, that's fine, mm-hmm. right? But what's really at stake here? Yeah, that's right. How she talked about Trump in a private space or the lives that are in danger every day because of what the administration and the police <laughs> and the FBI the CIA, like, like you know what I mean? Yeah, like, exactly. so if we want to get our panties in a bunch, mm-hmm. let's get them in a bunch. But about stuff that matters, <laughs> that matters, that's right. and not like that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so I think, but I think that, but the point of the article and the representation of the article was that, but this is the product of, like, what it means, like, when you are, don't feel represented and you don't feel like you're there, then you scrutinize yourself. But also. And this is the and my my whole point in that article was that it matters. Yeah, you want to see yourself, but it's also a trap mm. because this is not your platform. Yeah, you didn't build none of this stuff, right? right? CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, like you didn't build that. Build those. so they have their own standards, their own agendas. So it's cool. Like I said in the article, it's cool to be on CNN, mm. but it's cool to be on Sapelo Square. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because we run it. That's right. And who's better for us to represent us to the world than us? Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, so, you know, and so it's like, you have to like deal with these spaces. And so I think, so I think, I think there's a lot of pressures that come out of being a sort of a minority and b- being that way. But I think, you know, and this is what I called, I called it like this old black Muslim proverb, do for self. Right. I think you do really, for self. Do for right. self. Do for, and you yeah. really have to, I think mm-hmm. you really have to. Um, and I think about this too. I've been thinking about this recently um, in terms of Malcolm, because, um, you know, um, I was looking at one of his speeches and, and and just like the way he was so sophisticated with like the news people and like this, I think it was, it was this one of the later um, interviews he had and they wanted him to say something about Muhammad Ali and he was kind of like, no, he was like, anything <laughs> I have to say to him, I'll say to him, mm. this is what I can't talk about today, nice. right? And so there's a particular kind of self-confidence and, and knowledge of self right, that he has and awareness mm-hmm. and it's like, I know what you're here for, but that's I know what I'm here for. That's right. Okay. So, so we're going to play this game, <laughs> but I'm not, I, your agenda is not mine. Correct. I'm not beholden to that. Mm-hmm. And he came out of a Muslim community and he was building one as well before he was assassinated that had their own media. That's right. Right. Yeah. Right? yeah. So it's not, you don't, you don't deal with the media. Mm-hmm. Of course you do. Mm-hmm. But you got to, you, you, but you know, and they have their turns, but you have yours and you have your own spaces because ultimately I think, you know, 
and, and the last thing I have to say about this is also about audience. Like, and I think about this a lot, you know? It's like, you know, like as a black Latina Muslim woman, you know, I get frustrated when you turn on like MSNBC or CNN or someone and what New York Times, and it's the same Daisy guy, <laughs> right? Or the same Arab woman. Like, yeah, I get frustrated. But, you know, and, and, and for good reason, right? Because sure. the community should be represented broadly. That's right. But, like, I don't know if New York Times audience is who I really, I'm worried about talking to. Hmm. Right? Like, you know, these white liberals, I mean, that's cool. <laughs> but there's a whole lot of other people that's right. in this country mm-hmm. who are very important, right? Who don't read the New York Times, right? But, like, I want to be on The Breakfast Club. Mm. Because that's what they do. Or Sway in the Morning. Or like Right for the Final Call. Or like El Diario. Like there's a whole bunch of that's other right. spaces. A lot of voices. Right. Where there are a lot of people mm-hmm. who are really important, who's, who's, whose fates are linked to mine, that mm. I care about, that I love, that I'm concerned about. And like they don't read the New York Times opinion page. Yeah. So it'd be cool to do that. Yeah. <laughs> but like, who do I really want to talk to? And I think for me, that's a question I have. I'm, I guess I'm really posed for Muslims in the United States more broadly. Like, who are you investing in mm. trying to reach, huh. you know? And, and, I mean, and if you want to invest in the person who's New York Times, that's fine. Right, because that is a segment right. of the it's population. A, yeah, I mean, that's fine. Right. But then you got to do that with, you got to uh, keep your third eye open, right? So yeah. You got to be smart huh. about how you do that, right? That's right. Because you'll end up, right, I think just kind of sort of, you know, it's like becoming digestible for that audience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Challenging that. Right. Right. right? And this is I was going to say, like, kind of a combination of not only being like kind of the token uh, uh, for that audience, but also like the token Muslim, but also, like you said, um, the the acceptable or palatable Muslim. Right. And then, when, and what you're saying is palatable, right, exactly. acceptable, and, and it's, it's something that we say in polite society. Right. And then, how do you be in that space? And the, mm-hmm. the other thing too is like. Because, because again, and I say this in the article, like it's a the New York like writing an op in New York Times is important because it has a wide reach. Right? Mm. So I get that. Um, but it's also the point of like, but what are we doing, right? So what are you doing to sort of, if you if you if you have access to that platform, right? So how do you how do because because they're only because the way they're working they can only have one. It's like like being in a university, right? They can only be one of you. You have your one black professor, mm-hmm. one Latino professor, you wow. know, you want, they, they, you yeah. can't have, mm, one, <laughs> That's right. right. Um, and one, 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 one retires, you get the next one. <laughs> There's one, right? But part of like my job in a uni- institution, in a university is to try to, is to be like, no, 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 no. We're not going to have just one. Hmm. We're going to have a whole bunch of them. Right, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna figure out how I'm gonna do this. And you know, I'm not, you can't get all your secrets out because whatever, but you're gonna figure out how to like open that space. Mm-hmm. So I think when it comes to representation and when it comes to media and that kind of things too, it's important for people to, I think, use the platform that they're given to challenge, right, sort of dominant structures, but also it's like kind of like behind the camera challenge too, right? right. right. So it's, it's cool to have different voices in front, you know, people on the TV or anything, but who, because some, because who's green lighting? Yeah, that's right. Who are the, who are the gatekeepers? The gatekeepers, right. yeah. You know, I'm just listening to you talking, I'm, reminded of this earlier this week reading an interview with Jordan Peele where he he was asked oh will you make a movie with a white lead character and he's you know he he says well no I I've seen I've seen that movie and makes sense he's in a position where he can give an and audience look, but, but and look about look what happens I was about to say look the, what happens look at how that's covered are, no 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 look what happens when people who are talented mm-hmm. and imaginative and creative, right? When they are given the resources to, to, to let that fly. Look, yeah. look, look what happens. Like, people saw a Black Panther, mm. right? Like, look what happens <laughs> when, like, you don't have people, you know, and I'm sure there were still some 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 parameters because it's Disney, so I'm sure they had, like, whatever, right? <laughs> I mean, because they're, they're, they're the ones about to do this um, Aladdin live action thing, right? So, <laughs> I'm sure, right? But, I mean, but part of the reason why it was it's so powerful is because you can because you can feel it and you can see it that these really brilliant black people like 
just came together and created something fabulous and they mm. had the resources to do it. That's right. Right. And right. Just, and look at that. And, and look how and, and what kind of benefit the world gets when we have that. Right. Mm. And so, I mean, I think. And so, yeah. So he's like, I'm tired. I've seen that story before. Mm. Right. Yeah. But I think for me, the biggest thing about Jordan Peele and these kind of folks is like the possibilities. Like I was watching this PBS like film series, something with my husband a couple of years ago. And they had this one short, it was like a sci-fi film. And it was like, these people were like, you know, one of those, the world's ended, you got to go find the, you know, <laughs> find the thing that's going to save humanity or whatever. And it was like a, the, the, um, the, um, space, the spaceship, like staff was, I think maybe all South Asian or from different parts of Asia. And one of them was Muslim mm. and he died on the plane. On the spaceship, and so we were talking. Like, so, how, what do you do? Like, how do you bury somebody in space? <laughs> right, right. But like, but like, white folks ain't gonna talk. That's not gonna come up. Right? Cause like, yeah, because they're not living those experiences. They're not. Li- that is just not gonna come up. A so conversation. You, right. And so you have this really crazy thing where they do the woman. Cause I think I think two of them were Muslim. Like one wasn't, but like I think he was Muslim. So the woman, I think she does a janazah prayer. Like she does the prayer, and they put him out and they put him like into the space because like well he yeah. can't be dead on the planet. <laughs> right, right, right. But but like that conundrum, right? Mm. Like huh. what do you do? Like how do you bury somebody in space? Yeah. You know, like <laughs> you know, which is like comes up when people like are actually. Because we are smart. Like, we're smart enough. <laughs> we we're, have imagination. Right. We have all that. We just don't have no money. Mm. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And so I think, I think the possibilities are really, I think, exciting mm. and amazing and wonderful mm-hmm. that that can happen. Um, but I think we need people to green light it. So just to kind of go back to that point is that so if you are with these white folks at these tables and this kind of thing, it's like, what are you doing so that we can have some kind of movement? Yeah. Like whatever, whatever your white folks are, whoever they are, whatever your white people are, because we all have our own in our own spaces, right? Like whoever they are, like how are you pushing them so that you're not the only one? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we've talked about this before, where it's it's not. I mean, because I think you're framing the conversation one way, which is you know the way that one that you become the one black professor or the one Muslim professor or the one Latino professor. But there's also the idea from within where it's like, wait, wait a minute. You know, suddenly, like the the black Muslim feel, or the black, or the or the, uh, you know, the, the the token Muslim within the department feels threatened because now there's somebody else, and it's like, who's this new person? And mm-hmm. I'm trying to st- like, well, right? Well, we, like, I forgot which. Yeah, well, it's we're, like a, a, who is it? Marguerite Hill from Muslim Arc. She talks about this, like this uh-huh. kind of which, and uh, like this kind of scarcity, 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 scarcity. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> right, right. Right. Okay. This kind of scarcity mindset. There right? you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it's I, like, wait a minute. I was supposed right. to be the soul. Yeah. And I wrote, I wrote a piece with these black Jewish women. It was me and some black woman, black Jewish women wrote this piece about Ilhan Omar. And in it, we talk. We define white supremacy, and we talk about how one of the, one of the ways white supremacy works is that it makes people who are sort of the minorities feel like. You know, basically, it makes them try to vie for what they think they're going to get some access to power, even though they don't have any access mm. to power, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it creates this scarcity mindset, mm. you know, mm. where that, well, if there's only going to be one of us, mm. then it's going to be me. Mid- <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. That's right. But, but huh. it's like, wow. but no, it's like, and, and it's like, you know, it's like, but, oh, I was watching that, that show Love Is that Mark Lucker Kill had done, and there was a scene where, like, her character, um, and her character it has a, a, she's a black woman, and her character has a black woman friend, right? And they work together. Mm-hmm. And then they have the supervisor who's a black man. And one of them gets to write, and he's like, okay, so one of them has been there longer, and she wants to write, like, the script for whatever the show is for that, that particular episode. And he's like, okay, well, how about you write it together? And now he puts them in a position because the one who's been there longer deserved it and deserved it to have the full credit to herself. But then he puts her friend, and that's her friend. So now she's like, well, I really, and, so, and her friend should be like, okay, you know, like, oh, I shouldn't be on this, but I want to be on it. And then she, I, I want to help her, but what about me, right? And then they're trying to figure it out when the problem was his decision. He should have gave one to her and one to her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, problem but, solved. Right. But because, but he creates a limited thing, right? And now we got to fight each other right. for that, mm-hmm. right? right? And it's like, well, no. It's the difference between, like you said, a scarcity mindset versus... You know, thinking from a point of abundance, right. so, from a place of abundance, right. and in and in, and in her and in the in the episode, the friend who was there, she basically Marv Rucker kills character basically is like, you know what, this is yours. I'm gonna step back. 
right. right? And she ultimately gets something for herself too. So I think it's, I mean, it's difficult, um, this scarcity uh, to, to deal with that, but it's true and it affects us, I think, in a lot of different ways. Right. And so it's something that we have to kind of pay attention to. Well, thank you. I mean, wow. I know, yeah, we've, we've tried to touch on a lot of things. We've, and We've covered a lot of ground. One of the purposes of the show, at least from my vantage point, was just to get people uh, thinking about the book and and exposed to some of the ideas yeah. that you explore in the book and w- with the I- with the intent being that people go and check out the book for themselves. So, you know, one of the things we've been fortunate to do in addition to yourself, you know, we've had like for example John O'Brien on uh, or John John Brown. John, 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 John No, 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 John O'Brien uh, from yeah. uh, Keeping It Halal. Uh, he, 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 yeah, ethnography. But, but also Jonathan Brown. Yeah, but also Jonathan Brown. Uh, and then Zarina Graywall. Uh, talking about Islam and uh, Islam and, and uh, Islam is a foreign country, <laughs> uh, keeping it halal, just sort of other eth- ethnographies, exploring kind of communities. You can have Shabana Mir on. And Shabana Mir would be a great, you can great have guest. Mir, you can bring Sylvia. That's right. Um, All people bring, in the wish list. Right, so you yeah. Can bring uh, Miriam Kashani because she's writing her book about Zaytuna, so that'll be out in a couple of years, and she can talk about it now. So just invite. <laughs> Okay. Um, let me think. Who else? Um, Deborah Majid with her work on polygamy. Yeah. Jamil Kareem. Jamil Kareem. Yeah, that's right. Um, I'll send you a list. <laughs> please, please do. That's please awesome. do because I mean, yeah, we we we've had a, a a veritable wish list of people, and you've named some of them, and others you have, you know, that we is new to us. So we definitely want to continue doing that. But um, yeah. So you know, check out the book, please. Um, where can people get a copy of the book if they wanted well, to order? You can go to drsuad.com, okay. C-O-C-T-O-R-S-E-A-D.com, which is my website where there's information about my book um, and other things. You talk about cadence. I don't know the cadence that you just said the website is going to come out uh, you know, on, on, on the podcast, but it really should. Oh, yeah, so definitely check that out. Please do. C-O-C-T-O-R-S-U-A-D.com. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and is that, is that where people can um, not only check out the book, but also... Yes, they can, they can check out the book. Um, I have actually... Everything the, Dr. Swad yeah, is there. I have stuff. Like, I do little pieces of kind of like right. things about stuff from the book. I have a series okay. of photos um, from the book, um, from my performance. There's some stuff there, things I've written. Yeah. Great. Excellent. And uh, uh, speaking of websites, I mean, you can definitely continue to reach out to us on... Um, uh, sending us email at diffusecongruence at gmail.com um, or you can reach us uh, on our Facebook page which is facebook.com slash diffusecongruence and I've got a live audience here so I would be remiss if I didn't remind you to support uh, podcasts such as ourselves and others but certainly support our podcast and the way you can do that is to go to patreon.com slash diffusecongruence and you can become a monthly patron it's as little as a dollar a day although I would encourage you to do more a dollar, a dollar. Sorry, a dollar, a dollar, a dollar a month. month. Thank you. I wish it was a dollar a day. A dollar a month, and uh, uh, and you can become a supporter of the show. Allows us to, you know, um, um, you know, gives us the resources we need to capture the stories of individuals like Dr. Swad of Khabir and others, and to bring their ideas to capture to a and set free. That's right. To not for ourselves. No, no, no. To 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 bring to the audience uh, these. Uh, voices that I think are very much needed. So thank you, Dr. Swad, um, thank you. And for affording us the opportunity. Thank you for the audience and thank you for listening. And uh, you can uh, continue um, yeah, reaching out to us and uh, until, until next time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>